united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation by KSCE Channel 38 Christian Television. And now, United with Christ. My name is Doug Coyle. I am pastor of Grace Covenant Church in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Our web address is www.gccnm.com. We also have two churches, sister churches here in El Paso. One is Christ the King on the west side of El Paso and Las Tierras Community Church on the east side of El Paso. I want to put our Greek word for the day up on the board. This is the word we'll be learning together. And it's the Greek word, morphe. So I'll put a translation right underneath there. Morphe. This Greek word literally means nature or essence. And you'll recall that the New Testament part of your Bible is written in Greek. And so this is found in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8. In chapter 2 of Philippians, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church in the city of Philippi. And he's talking to them about who Jesus is and what he has done. And he's trying to encourage these Christians uh, to love one another and serve one another in the body of Christ. And what we have in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, is really an eyewitness testimony as to who Jesus is and what he did. We believe that these eyewitnesses can give us a better understanding of who Jesus is than scholars 2,000 years removed or historians who weren't there and speculate and have their own ideas about Jesus, whether he was a hippie or a feminist or all sorts of different ideas about Jesus. But in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, we have unmistakably the clearest teaching about who Jesus is by those who knew him and by those first Christians uh, who gathered together uh, to worship and uh, praise and believe in this Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I'll begin reading that verse. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So Paul, again, is writing to a group of Christians in the city of Philippi. That's why this book is called Philippians. And these are the first Christians ever in this city. This is the first church, Christian church ever in the city of Philippi. And his command here is that he wants them to have the same attitude that Jesus has. And just a couple of verses earlier, he was talking about how they should relate to one another, how they should love one another, how they should be united in heart and mind, and how they should uh, treat others as better than themselves and to serve one another. And then he's now turning to why Christians should do this. And the reason we should do this, he says, is because we should have the same attitude that Jesus had. We live in a day of talk shows. Perhaps the most famous talk show that was on when I was growing up was a show called Jerry Springer. Some of you may remember that, but today they still have many talk shows that are like that. And the reason people tune in is they want to hear the innermost details of other people's lives, hear these salacious details, these inner secrets of what's going on in other people's lives, and they're attracted to watching that. In these verses, we have... Uh, just a peek into the inner life, the innermost secrets of Jesus Christ. We, we see for just a brief couple of verses the, the inner attitude and being of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, in these verses, if you have your Bible, you'll notice that verses 5 all the way through 11 are indented. I'm not sure if we can get that on the screen, but in most translations, you'll see there's sort of normal writing, and then this is indented. Now, you might wonder why is that indented in your Bible. The reason that it's indented is because scholars and translators believe that Paul is here quoting from either a creed or a song. In other words, most biblical scholars think that when Paul says, you should have the same attitude that Jesus Christ has, and here's the attitude that he has, he then quotes a creed. A creed is simply a doctrinal statement. It's a statement of faith. Every church has one. 
They have a, a statement of, here are the things that we believe. And so some Bible scholars believe that this is one of the first doctrinal statements ever written, ever believed by Christians, and that throughout the ancient world, in every worship service, Christians were reading and saying this creed out loud as a statement of faith. Other Bible scholars think that perhaps it was not a creed, but really a song, that this is one of the first hymns that was ever written, and that this was a song that would have been sung in every church throughout the world. Now, this would be equivalent to saying that, that what we're about to read, it's kind of like the song Amazing Grace, or the song God of Wonders, or And Can It Be, some of those hymns and songs that, that everyone knows and we sing, this right here would have been a song that every Christian knew and sang, just like we sing, Amazing Grace. And so let's look at what this song or this creed teaches us. The first thing we're going to see is that at the beginning of this song, Jesus is presented as divine. He's presented as God. Listen to what it says here. Jesus, who being in very nature God. As a pastor, I often get questions such as, why do you Christians believe that Jesus is God? Why do you believe in the Trinity? If Jesus is God, why doesn't the Bible just say it clearly? Or they'll say things like, if Jesus is God, why didn't he just say somewhere in the Bible, I am God, in those simple words? Well, first, Jesus did declare himself to be God. He says in the Bible that God is his Father, and there he's declaring that he is of the same nature as God, and that's why those Jewish leaders, when they heard Jesus say that, said that this one is claiming to be equal with God. In John 8, Jesus declares himself to be the I Am, which is the name of God. Jesus in John 14 says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus claims to forgive sins, which is a divine prerogative. So Jesus does put himself forward as being God. But here's the thing. If Jesus merely said, I am God, that would not be very convincing. In the ancient world, every Caesar or emperor declared himself to be God and required of all the citizens that they declare that Caesar is God. So for Jesus to simply say the words, I am God, would be nothing new, nothing unique. In fact, in our own day, we have people who say the same thing about themselves. You might be familiar with Shirley Klein and the New Age movement. She'll rent a hotel and she'll have a conference where lots of people come into this huge conference room, and she has people running around these conference rooms shouting, I am God. I am God. So there's nothing peculiarly unique about saying I am God. So the Bible goes far beyond that. In these verses here, we see something said about Jesus that is not said anywhere else of any, any other person in human history. It goes far beyond the mere words of I am God. Listen again to these words. Philippians 2, verse 6, Jesus being in very nature God. That word nature, Jesus is in very nature God. There's our Greek word, morphe. Morphe simply means the nature of something, the essence of something, the core of what it is. And this is the word that the Bible uses to describe that Jesus is of the very nature of God. I'm going to put another Greek word up here. This is a word that the Bible could have used, but did not. This is the word schema. This word means accidents or non-essentials. Or something that is outward and tangential. 
So the difference between these two words is one of them is the essence and the core and the nature. The other one is sort of accidents, non-essential things or outward things. And I want to give you a couple of examples of the difference between these two words because it gives us clarity as to what the Bible is telling us about Jesus. So when we talk about morphe and schema, every object in this world has both of these, a morphe and a schema. So let me give you an example. What is the morphe or the nature of a ball? So there are different types of balls. There are tennis balls, there are volleyballs, and there are basketballs. So what's the nature or the essence of what it means to have a ball? Well, the morphe or nature of a ball would be round and bouncy. That's what a tennis ball, a volleyball, and a basketball all share in common. They're round and bouncy. That's their morphe. So what is the schema or the outward things or the accidents of a ball? Well, one example would be green and fuzzy. Well, that's a tennis ball. It's green and fuzzy, but that's not part of its nature because a ball can not only be green and fuzzy, but a ball can also be white like a volleyball or a ball can be orange like a basketball. It can be leathery or it can be plastic or it can be rubber. Those things are accidents. The morphe of a ball is that it's round and bouncy. Its accidents are whether it's green or red, whether it's leather or plastic. And so you begin to see the difference. I'll give you another example with myself. I'm Doug Coyle. And my morphe, or my essence, is who I am. It's my soul. It's my mind. It's my memories. It's my person. That's my morphe. My schema would be those things about me that are accidents, they're not essential. So for example, whether I have large muscles and I'm cut and ripped or whether I am skinny would be an accident. So whether I look like The Rock or Arnold Schwarzenegger in terms of my muscles or whether I look like Mick Jagger and Michael Jackson, I'm skinny with not big muscles, those things aren't essential to who I am as Doug Coyle. They're accidents. Now you might be wondering, he's wearing a jacket, just to let you know, I am closer to Arnold Schwarzenegger and The Rock. But those things would be my schema. They're not essential to who I am. I'll give you another example. My arm right here. Would this arm that I have be my morphe? Is it part of the essence of what I am? Or would it be a schema? Would it be an accident or a non-essential? Let's say I got in an automobile accident, and during, in that accident, my arm got cut off. Am I still Doug Coyle? The answer is yes, my morphe hasn't changed. My arm is just a schema. It's an accident, it's tangential to who I really am. It's, it's outward, it's non-essential. So here's what the Bible is saying. Jesus is the very morphe of God. In other words, Jesus has the very nature of God, the very essence of God. This is what the Bible is teaching you. Whatever it is that makes God God, that's what Jesus is. Whatever it is that belongs to the divinity of God, it also belongs to Jesus. God the Father and God the Son have the same nature. And that's why in John 5, when Jesus said, God is my Father, the Jewish leaders knew what he was saying, that he's of the same nature as the Father, and he's declaring himself to be equal with God. So Jesus is the very nature of God, and verse 6 goes on to drive this home even more deeply. Look at verse 6 again. Jesus, being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So here we are told that Jesus has equality with God. The Greek word here, equality, is the Greek word isos, which uh, simply means equal. That's what the word means, is equal to. You are probably familiar this, with this word if you remember back to geometry classes that you took in high school. Now some of you are trying to block those memories out. But if you recall, in geometry, you probably learned what an isosceles triangle is. An isosceles triangle is a triangle with at least two sides that are equal. And that's why it's called an isosceles triangle. So here we are told that Jesus is isos. 
He's equal with God. He's the very nature of God, and he's equal with God. Again, in John chapter 5, that's what the Jewish leaders concluded. Jesus is claiming to be, and it uses the same word, isos, equal with God. Now, this verse goes on to say this. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, this verse does not say Jesus did not consider equality something to be grasped after or something to be sought for or something to be reached out for. It's not saying that Jesus didn't think equality with God was something to strive for. The reason it doesn't say that is because, one, it doesn't add those words. But secondly, we were just told at the beginning of verse 6 that Jesus is the very nature of God which means he's equal with God. So this verse is not saying that Jesus did not consider equality something that he should strive for. No, Jesus already has equality. So what is this verse saying? What this verse is saying is this, is that Jesus does not consider his equality with God something that he has to clutch on to, something that he has to cling on to in such a way that he's unwilling to humble himself, to become a servant. Jesus does not so hold on to his deity that he's not willing to humble himself. Jesus does not so clutch on to his divine nature that he's not willing to take on serving. There's a willingness in Jesus to do something even though he's God. And the next verse tells us what that is. Verse 7. Here's what Jesus is willing to do even though he's God. Jesus, verse 7, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So first we're told that Jesus made himself nothing. God makes himself nothing. The one equal with God makes himself nothing. Now, some translations say that Jesus emptied himself, and actually that's much closer to the meaning of the Greek word. The Greek word is, is this word right here, kenosis, and it does mean to empty oneself. And so that translation is actually better, that Jesus emptied himself. The, the trouble with that translation is what many people then go on to say is, well, Jesus emptied himself of his deity, and then he took on the nature of humanity. That can't be what this verse is teaching because God could never give up his godhood. The divine can never give up his divinity. What this verse is saying is that Jesus, the Greek is Jesus literally emptied himself. He emptied himself. Not he emptied himself of deity, but he emptied himself, which means he humbled himself. Here's what this verse is saying. That Jesus, though he's God, though he's divine, did not so cling and grasp onto his deity in such a way for self-aggrandizement. Jesus so held on to his divine nature in such a way that it was selfish promotion that he was only concerned with. No, what it's telling us is that Jesus is the nature of God. He's equal with God. And yet he humbles himself. And the way he empties and humbles himself is by taking something on. Now see, this is just the opposite of what we do as human beings. If we get just a little bit of status, a little bit of power, a little bit of popularity, we cling to it. And we, when we, we, we use it in such a way to make ourselves more popular. If we get a little bit of status, we use it to make ourselves more wealthy. This is what we do because we are selfish human beings. And that's why Paul the Apostle has to stress that Jesus is unlike us. He doesn't cling to his status of divinity in such a way that it's for self-promotion. No, Jesus, Jesus is willing to humble himself. And we're told that he takes on a human nature. Jesus, who from all eternity is in the glories of heaven. He's in a place of absolute blessedness and perfection and love, and joy. There is deep fellowship between God the Father and God the Son in the glories of heaven, in the pageantry of all of its glory. And what does Jesus do? He gives it all up. He comes down here, humbles himself to take on our human nature. 
Why does Jesus take on our human nature according to this verse? And that word nature, Jesus takes on our nature, it's the same word. It's morphe. Jesus has a divine nature, but he takes on a human or an anthropos morphe, a human nature. So Jesus is both nature of God and nature of man. He's fully God and fully man. That's where we get this belief from. What Christians sang, what Christians recited in their creed from the very beginning, and we've done for 2,000 years. But Jesus takes on a human nature for one reason, to save us. If Jesus wanted to save fish, he could have come as a fish. If he wanted to save plants, he could have come as a plant. But Jesus comes as a human being because he's coming to save humans from their sin. And let's look at what it takes for Jesus to do that. Verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus could have stayed in heaven. Jesus could have remained above, away from this world of sin and crime and disease and hatred. He could have remained up above. But here we see the descent of Jesus. He takes on our human nature and he continues to descend, to sacrificially humble himself. Jesus comes into this world being born of an average mother. Jesus is born into a stable. Jesus lives a life in which he faces the same trials and, and infirmities that, that each of us face. And then Jesus is put on trial by sinners. And he is mocked. And he is beaten. And he exposes his back to the whip. I can only imagine the angels of heaven crying out, Enough! But Jesus continues to descend. They take him to a wooden cross and they nail him to it. And Jesus continues to bleed. He continues to die. Again, the, the angels with these shrieks from heaven saying, no more. But Jesus continues to descend, succumbing to the violence and hatred of sinners until the point where he dies upon a cross. This is what our Savior has done. Jesus has died, not just in a normal death, but a death on a cross. That cross was a symbol of absolute curse and condemnation, and Jesus on the cross bears the curse and the condemnation that we deserve. You see, this is, this is the glories of the gospel that that Paul lays out here by quoting this song, quoting this creed that Jesus leaves the highest of heavens to descend literally to the depths of hell. Jesus on the cross takes our deserved death. This song that those Christians sang, this creed that they recited every Sunday in their churches when they met, uh, whether it was in a home or in a church building or in catacombs or, or in fear by a river, they would sing the song that we've just read. They would recite it as a creed. And every time what they would read in the story of Jesus is not a rags to riches story. They would read a riches to rags story. Because that's the gospel. Jesus leaves the glories of heaven to enter into our world and take on our humanity, our flesh and blood, to do for us what we could not do and to save us from our sins. Now what's the, the whole point of the Apostle Paul's quoting this song or this creed? Let me read to you again why. Verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul wants you to have the, the same attitude of Jesus, this riches to rags story. This is what Paul wants every Christian to be like. Let me read for you those verses that preceded this, that the, the attitude that God wants us to have as Christians. In Philippians 2 verse 1, we read these words, If you have any encouragement 
from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by doing this. Be like-minded. Having the same love for one another. Being one in spirit and in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Do you hear what, what was just said there? You are, as a Christian, to consider others better than yourselves. In this world that we live in, and in this particular society of the United States, we're all about equality. Everybody's clamoring, clamoring for their own rights, and, and we should be treated as equals. That's what everyone in our country believes, but that's not what Christians believe. We don't believe in equality. Here's what we believe in. Treat others not as equal, but better than yourself. That's the high calling. Verse 4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And why? Because this is exactly the attitude of Jesus. This is what he has done. Jesus did not grasp and clutch for his own selfish purposes. This past Sunday at church, my youngest son came up to me and at our church before the service, we have uh, breads and donuts and coffee and so forth like many churches. And my son got this donut that he just really loves and he came up to me after church and he was holding it on a napkin and he was looking at me like, look what I got, dad. And there was someone else from my church who was standing next to me, another adult. And just in a joking manner, he went like this and he said, oh, did you bring that for me? And my son instinctively went like this. It's mine. It's my donut. And that's what we do. That's our nature. Well, why is it that no human being does this? When we're holding that thing and that person from my church said, oh, did you bring that for me? Why do we not go instinctively to give it? Instead, instinctively we clutch, we keep, we're selfish. This is what we do by nature. But do you see what Jesus, who is fully God, do you see what he has done? He didn't grasp. He didn't clutch. Instead, he gave. Instead, he took on our human nature. This is what Jesus has done. And now he says, do likewise. The fact that Jesus has done this, that's what saves us. That the God of heaven and earth died on a cross for our sins, that saves us. It's not what we do. It's what he's done. But... What Jesus has done also transforms us. It turns us into people who want to live like Jesus did. It turns us into his followers who want to serve him in the same manner that he served us. Thank you. Thank you for watching United with Christ. We pray this has been a blessing to you and we invite you to tune in again tomorrow. We invite your comments, questions, or prayer requests. You may contact us at KSEE Christian Television, 2201 East Wyoming Avenue, El Paso, Texas, 79903, or call us at 915-532-8588 during regular business hours, or you can visit us on our website at www.kse.com. God bless you.